Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, today I am speaking again with James Lindsay. James is an author and he's just recently started a new project called New Discourses. And his books, his re most recent book is How to Have Impossible Conversations, A Practical Guide. And he's got a forthcoming one, hopefully out this summer, uh, called Cynical Theories. That's co-written with uh, Helen Plucklows and How to Impo Have Impossible Conversations was co-written with Peter Bogosian. Hey James, thanks for coming on. Hey, yeah, and hopefully Cynical Theories will make it out before the end of the summer. The book market is like, I don't mean the market, right? So the book industry is cratered around the virus right now. I was talking to the publisher the other day. Um, the original publication date was supposed to be in May. That got pushed to June. Now we're looking at August, and that's like with our fingers crossed because the uh, entire book industry, book sales, as a matter of fact, believe it or not, are down 70%. So, like, the, the whole thing is dead. And the, Amazon's not ordering books to their warehouse because they're non-essential items. So, like, most people in the universe buy their books on Amazon now, and mm. Amazon's not ordering books to ship. So it's like, holy crap. So hopefully it will be out sometime mid or late this summer. We can, we can move it around a little bit because right. of the nature of the pandemic. But it's tentatively now moved to august maybe we can bring that sooner and hopefully we won't have to push it later okay i mean i don't want to get into the whole publishing thing but couldn't like i would just think buying ebooks would become more popular now if you couldn't get hard hardcover like it just well, it, uh, yeah it kind of is but like i said the entire like you wouldn't think so because people are home and buying books and wanting to read and mm -hmm. like they uh, given the number of times they email me they clearly have free time mm -hmm. um they, you know, it's shocking that the entire, across the board, the entire industry is just like way down. And uh, so there's also weird stuff with releasing an ebook, an audio book, and then the hardcover coming out like two to three months later. It yeah. just, it's just so, such a weird time right now. Uh, hopefully the book will be out this summer. It's supposed to be a game changer. It's what I keep getting told. Oh, I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, if you haven't got a copy, like pre-order it. But also I suggest you pre-order the uh, the audio version just so you can hear the phrase big black butts in the Plucrosian Exus accent. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Helen had to, had thought it was going to be useful to put in an example. Um I think that's in the post-colonial theory where we're talking about decolonizing, but I don't remember exactly where it is. And she put in some paper that was about big black butts and that maybe the need to decolonize big black butts or something like that. And so then she's reading the audio book and realizes that she has to read those words now out loud in her own voice. And she had a little meltdown on Twitter about it. Um, Anyway, so if you were, uh, sorry, I had a little bit of a digression here, but still, uh, if you want to talk about new discourses, like, I know you just started that now, but like, how long have you been working on that? Like, how, like, why did you decide to do that? And why did you think there was a need for it? Sure. Yeah. I think the idea for new discourses really kind of started coming together last summer. Um, coming out of the grievance studies affair in, uh, what was that, October 2018, we, the group of us, meaning Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose and Mike Nana and I, realized we kind of needed to build some kind of a platform that would kind of aggregate things and centralize what we were doing. We could never quite figure out how we wanted to do it, though. And it's like being all a bunch of international, you know, two Americans, uh, an Australian and a Brit. It's like we had these all these weird things. Like, how do you build a business around that? Do we just build a website? Does it compete with Aereo? We don't want to compete with Aereo. What do we do? And so it's like we never quite figured out what we wanted to do with all of that. And then as time went on, it's like each of our focuses kind of, you know, drifted in different directions. Peter got very involved in, well, he started to try to look at critical pedagogy, but then he kind of just got really embroiled in, uh, a very heavy teaching load from Portland State that more or less took him off the map. And then it was, they, they increased his teaching load maybe as a punishment for us doing the grievance studies affair. I don't know. And so then Helen got very interested in trying to push British left politics. And uh, she's gone very, you know, scholarly with a lot of things. And I just kept kind of digging and digging and digging and digging. And so it kind of came to mind that maybe we should just create 
or I should just create actually a platform and, you know, they're helping out, they're involved in various levels and ways. Peter and Helen are Mike isn't as much. He's gone all into the production of the film around the grievance studies affair. You, I mean, it's not like we've lost contact, but we barely, any of us barely speak to Mike anymore because he's gone in some kind of like film editing rabbit hole and I don't know, he's busy. So um, we've all kind of, gone in slightly different directions. And so I started the idea of wanting to create kind of an educational resources platform that would aggregate the materials that we already had, which I'm trying to slowly do without it just being dropping a whole bunch of crap we did in the past. And then um, also start to provide more clarity that really to the, the original idea was to educate people about what I now call critical social justice, which I used to call the social justice movement with a capital S and J. And um, more broadly than that, of course, if you if you really want to get into it, it was my thought was if you remember in I guess late summer 2017, Helen and I published an essay titled "A Manifesto Against the Enemies of Modernity," and we talked about how the fringe lunatics on the far right and the fringe lunatics on the far left are sort of um, mirror images of one another and neither of them represent the mainstream which uh, is is modernity and so really the point of new discourses is to kind of unlock our our, we feel i feel like our discourses in public our public conversations how we're allowed to talk about things are kind of locked up by these fringe groups on the edges like the political correctness culture and the um far left it makes it so that you have to like use their terms in kind of weird ways and and all that you know you get absolutely canceled if you say the wrong thing and all of this stuff so that's constraining discourse and then on the far right people aren't as aware of it i don't know how but it's like you can't even give justifiable criticism of the president. You, it's just, it's like, uh, okay. Yeah. The far right, like I've, I've been saying this for a while and it's, um, okay. Cause, cause I know you push back on it and I see you do it. And I mean, you know, people are like, Oh, well he dunks on the left. So I'm going to follow him. But then they're pro Trump. And if you say something about Trump, then you know, you'll get a few oh, sides, right? God, I got a uh, bomb by the white supremacists a couple of weeks ago. They were like sending me nasty, dangerous like emails and stuff because I said that I didn't think we should have a white culture. It like the goal of responding to social justice is not to dig down into a white culture; it's to get the race out of the idea entirely. Yeah. And the, yeah. but I mean, like, like someone like a Candace Owens, okay, you know, okay, take the Nick Fuentes out of it, take the Richard Spencers out of the equation, right? You know, like. These guys are, you know, clearly racist, bigoted, white supremacists. But someone like Candace Owens, who's you know considered an up and coming star, uh, there was something yesterday. I think it was uh, what's uh, uh, Glenn Beck was saying that, uh, and this is nothing against Beck, but he was just saying that oh she's she's seriously considering a run for politics. Oh yeah, it doesn't surprise me at least in the least. But that's a nightmare. Like Candace, it Owens is a nightmare, is, and like she is a right wing version of. So you know, SJWs, if she got into politics, she would be the right wing version of uh, Cortez. It's, I mean, as far I as mean, I can tell. yeah, I would say that's an accurate description. She's, um, you can tell because everything she says is the left, Democrats, blah, 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 blah. It's so divisive. That's the problem that the, the hyper politicization of everything in our dialogue was the problem that New Discourses was meant to solve. So I don't find a lot of room for you know supporting it on right or left the reason i talk more about the social justice issue which is more on the left is because i'm actually an expert in that and i still have that kind of academic um i don't know virtue i guess of trying not to speak too far outside of my lane and um at the same time i resist the the temptation to become a angry pundit as much as possible which I think that, I mean, this this whole punditry thing is the problem, right? And so I spend more time talking about social justice because a few reasons. One, I actually understand it. Like, I really get it. And then two, it's on the left and I'm on the left. So it's not a partisan attack and it won't be perceived as just a partisan attack if I try to clean up 
so-called my own side. And um, three, because uh, it's what I've actually been trying to work on for quite some time. And in fact, I believe that the the problem is the polarization and anything that can kind of it's like the left kicks the right, the right kicks the left, the left kicks the right. And it just goes around and around and around. If somebody can just pull one of those stops out, then the cycle doesn't continue. So if something discredits social justice, most of the right wing punditry machine loses a ton of its ability to continue doing what it's doing. So the whole point is to break the cycle. And I can break the cycle on one side much more effectively than I can break the cycle on the other side. Because the second I try to speak about anything that the right might be doing wrong, I'm just a libtard all of a sudden. I'm completely discredited. Yeah. I have Trump derangement syndrome. I get accused of having Trump derangement syndrome all the freaking time. Orange man bad. And it's like, holy shit, it's literally the same thing oh, that yeah. you see coming out of the social justice warriors, but in defense of literally an indefensible administration. Um, which is why you have to have that kind of behavior, because it's defending the indefensible. So it requires being ridiculous. It requires, frankly, being almost postmodern in your approach to do it. Yeah, no, the, 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 the I mean, I, I kept calling it the overcorrection, and it's and it's not like this is an overcorrection now. I think it's, you know, I'd say since about the 50s, it's been going back and forth, you know, like it's been pulling right one way, mm -hmm. and then it's, you know, an overcorrection on the left, and it just, like, the pendulum's slowly being like being pulled further back each time and it's it's now we're at a point where it's like okay you need to put something right in the middle to stop it or slow it down because it it's got to stay in the middle for a little bit like we can't keep going from crazy to crazy because that's what we're doing right now which is i mean i don't know if this statistic is still true or not but i remember when i took driver's ed like in i was 16 so like 200 years ago or whatever it works out to I, when I remember when I took driver's ed, though, one of the points that was raised, it was like, do you do you know what the number one? I remember having to watch a dramatic video about it. One of the number one reasons for traffic accidents was involving fatalities. And it was like, you wouldn't guess it. It's not drunk driving. It's not this. It's not that. It's oversteer. And so the, th the thing is, it's like a squirrel or a rabbit or a deer or a kid or s another car or something gets in your path all of a sudden. And you, instead of like swerving around it by turning the wheel the correct amount, you jerk the wheel really hard and you end up in the ditch and flipping your car. And that re overreaction that you're talking about, the oversteer. And so you, you jerk the wheel left really hard and, oh, my God, now we're in this terrible place. And you start jerking the wheel right. And then the next thing you know, your car is barrel rolling down sideways down the embankment off the side of the road. Um, that's I mean, that's literally one of the leading causes. I don't know if it's the leading cause. I don't know if it was even true back in the 90s when I was taught that. But that is one of the leading causes of traffic fatalities or people dying in, in in the operation of a car is oversteer and it seems to me that we've now for whatever set of reasons decided that that's going to be our operating principle in society is let's just oversteer every chance we get yeah um okay like there i just want to get back to the new discourses because one of the things you're doing i think it's like really because I'm, I'm using it with my friends now just like us like here uh you're uh, the dictionary you have in there that's right. Like, yeah. We're putting in the terms because it's, it's like, okay, well, you know, racism is this or like, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, why aren't you anti-racist? It's like, okay, here, this is what it means. And it's because, okay, right. um, I'm 50. So this is for people my age. And so, you know, my, my friends who are like from, you know, their mid forties to like their early fifties, who don't really know anything about this stuff, hear it. And they're like, okay, well, anti-racism sounds good. I'm like, no, 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 it's not. I like that dictionary you're working on. I really like that. Yeah. So this is where, where it kind of gets into that. Um, I want to like stop the oversteer problem, if you will. And part of the reason that we're having this oversteer is we keep finding ourselves like, oh, you know, we need to have a diversity program and that sounds really good and let's get into it. And then all of a sudden you it's installed already. It's already policy. And then you realize it's a nightmare. 
And so you people freak out and overreact and, and you get these kind of things. And one of the core things that I've identified, and I think it's true, frankly, on both sides, but um, I, I don't know that it's as pervasive on the right by any stretch. The, the social justice stuff has literally, I don't even know the right way to phrase this. They've literally rewritten our own language. It's like for us, we're speaking English. So they speak English, but literally it's different English. It, it, it's not like they're speaking French where things mean the same stuff, but there's different words. Or German where there's, you know, a word for everything that has 400,000 syllables. They have literally taken the language that we use and they mean something different by phrases and, and words that we all under, think we understand. So they can pull this kind of thing off. And I, they haven't done this with a few terms. This is... I don't know how many there are. I've identified nearly 500 for this encyclopedia that I'm building. Some of which are, you know, specific academic terms, but many of which are these kind of redefined everyday words. And the the only thing that it can point to, and this is what people don't understand, is this isn't just some kind of scholars or students or administrators that have a weird kind of vocabulary that's very technical. These words all go together in a particular mindset. So if you can get into that mindset, you then can use words that way. But if you don't, then it's just like having to learn a ton of new vocabulary. And so um, it's very, very difficult. Like you said, so I guess some examples are good. You know, people talk about anti-racism. That's the one you brought up. And why is anti-racism good? You know, it sounds good. We should be against racism. That's obviously what anti-racism means is against racism. Why on earth would anybody consider that to be a bad thing? And it's, well, it gets really murky because in spirit, what they're even selling you isn't a bad thing. They're saying, well, racism is very pervasive and we're really taking steps to get rid of it. And anti-racism means that you have to commit a little bit more than just not being racist yourself. Then they go on to say, in fact, you can't not be racist. You can either be racist or anti-racist. And that's where you get your first hint, right? Something something foul is going on here because now it's like you have to choose sides with nothing. They, they, they explicitly say there is no neutral. There is no middle. You have to choose our side, anti-racism, or the or or racism, nothing in between. You're either with us or you are one of the worst things our society considers. And so then you start looking into it, and they 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 say that it's an ongoing and lifelong commitment. And they're like, wait, what? You know, lifelong commitment, and what's involved in that commitment is is, is a a process of self-reflection self-critique and social activism. <laughs> so you have to make a lifelong commitment to being an activist who's digging into yourself to figure out ways ever more tendentious that you're actually being racist according to their also twisted definition of racism, which is based on their twisted definition of power and race to more twisted definitions. And you ju- it's just layer upon layer upon layer deep of that they – they're actually speaking. I, I keep using this as a clumsy phrase, so I don't know how I need a better one. But I keep saying that that they're using different English, for lack of a better term. And oh, yeah. if you understand the mindset, different English makes sense. But that's why I'm creating that encyclopedia on new discourses. But okay, like to me, it seems like um, okay, take the uh, the word proof. Now, if you if if you have uh, you know people like like mathematicians talking about a proof right mm-hmm. it means something very specific and that is you know mathematical jargon right right now if i if i'm speaking with my buddies and like okay yo uh, i saw a ufo last night they're like well give me proof like it, it means two different things sure 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 they mean evidence in that case uh, yeah. right but like everything i see from coming out of these things and like you know, th- thanks to like following you, I've read a lot of this stuff now, and I've read a lot of these books, and it's just horrifying. But like they're taking their jargon from like you know, if you want to use race or racism as jargon in your field, that's one thing, right? In your field of study. But then when you expect the rest of the population to use it without giving any context, that's when it becomes a problem. And it's like that's what it seems like they're trying to do. It's like okay, well you know. 
we've got this body of knowledge and this is how you have to use it, but I don't see mathematicians going, well, you can't use proof that way because that's not what it means. Right. Yeah. This is, I mean, it's basically the kind of elitism you see with people who are insecure, honestly, in a, on a certain level in, in their knowledge. So what they're they're doing is that they aren't just saying, oh, well, there is this technical definition. What they're saying is we are we are the priests and prophets, the elites of this society, and we understand this definition better than anybody else. In fact, the theory that they use explains everybody else's definition of this is actually wrong and was created so that you would misunderstand the concept. So the definition of racism that we all use, prejudice based on race, for example, uh, that, that, def that definition is incorrect and was created by the racist system to hide what racism really is. That's the mindset that they're, they're operating from. So they feel like they have the true, like they have, they've, they've put on the magic goggles and read the golden tablets and they have the real true definition of racism where society's actually been lying to all of us about the real one. That's, I'm not exaggerating. And I sound like a crazy person when I explain this stuff, but that is, and you've read enough of it now where you, you know I'm not crazy. That's actually how they think about the concept is that they have the real definition as the, you know, I said priests, I said prophets, I said elites. They are, they're the learned class. They're the, they're the scholars in their robes. And all of us are the stupid lay people, the stupid plebs who don't understand. And we need to go to them to be properly instructed. I mean, I've made the analogy a few times. I guess I need to write something at some point to make it really explicit is that they, they have set themselves up as the philosopher kings of our era. They believe that they're smarter than everybody, that they understand everything better than everybody, and that they are going to set the terms and actually administrate. They're going to institutionalize themselves and administrate these rules on all of us stupid people who can't be trusted to think for ourselves because we all are embedded in a system that teaches us to think the wrong way if we try to think for ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was yeah. A, awful lot there, but no. But it's and if you say that straight out, it's like okay, you're you got a conspiracy theory going. And that's I know, and the, the thing is, it's even crazier. It's I mean, we're not even to the full level of crazy. This is why I sound insane to everybody, mm -hmm. and everybody says to me they're like nah, but it's like you you don't even have to try to find resources where they say stuff like this. It's not like they hide it. It's in like literally everything they write, and the the, the deeper part is it's. <sighs> It's not just a conspiracy theory. They don't think there are any conspirators. They think it's a self-fulfilling like, and self-creating system that once it was set up, it just keeps going. Um, and so we are actually all in on the conspiracy, but none of us know it except them. Oh, no, sorry. I, I, I meant that if you – like the way you talk – like you know, the way you're talking about it, and I you know, I read enough of this stuff, and I can – you know, I, I worked in a government. Right? Technically, I still do. Um, I saw that stuff coming in, so like – the way you're talking about it, like people say, like you're, you know, you're a conspiracy theory nut, because it's, it's like a death by a thousand cuts for the average person until now that it's starting to get more and more out in public life. Right, you right, know, right. You know, like so, they might not like I, I know their worldview is not so much that it's, it's a conspiracy. Like you know, it might have been a conspiracy, whatever, in 1619, I guess. Um, but now it's just the whole system, so everyone just does it blindly. But you calling it out, you know, you're you're young. I sound like a lunatic. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, so. I get told I'm a lunatic all the time, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, um, I don't. And they're like, you know, they the same thing as the UFOs. You're like, show me proof. <laughs> and so it's like screenshot after screenshot mm -hmm. after screenshot, paper after paper after paper, quote after quote after quote, and they're like, yeah, that doesn't. They don't really mean that though. You're not reading it the right way. And it's like holy crap. Um, I mean, there is a way to read it that's that's internally consistent where this stuff goes together. And when you actually realize what they're saying, you become one of the people who sounds crazy okay, because like, you've. I mean, I don't. I don't know how outspoken of an atheist you were. Like, I read your book. Um, you know, everybody's wrong about God, or whatever. Everyone gets wrong about God, but I. Um, but speaking of a religious person, like, you know, I, I happen to, like, go speak to a lot of Muslims and stuff. Um, 
it's the same exact thing. Oh, well, you know, you, you, it's like in my case, like, well, you don't understand Arabic and like, that's why you don't get it. And, mm -hmm. oh, you know, you, you know, you're, you weren't, you, you didn't practice your faith enough or you didn't believe enough. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's the exact same excuse. It's just. Yeah. The thing that, that they call faith that you're used to calling faith or it's that you don't know it in, in uh, Arabic or whatever it happens to be, all of those layers there's actually, when I said that they have different English, the right phrase for that, which nobody would understand, is critical English. They call that state of mind critical consciousness. They call their faith critical consciousness. Okay, so this it's on the encyclopedia as a term that explains what critical consciousness is. But it means being able to see the world through critical theory, you know, which means seeing the world the way they see the world. That is their faith. And so when, when you read something... Or you tell them, you know, you talk about the issue with somebody who believes in this stuff. Or you read one of their books and you criticize it. They come back with, well, you didn't read it right or you didn't properly engage. That's a common phrase. You didn't properly engage. Uh, like you dismissed it or you're only looking to find where it's wrong. You weren't trying to understand it correctly. What they're actually telling you is you didn't read it from within the faith. And therefore, of course, you didn't get it. Because, of course, if you read the Quran from within the Islamic faith, the Quran says something completely different that you're sure makes sense. If you read the Bible from within the Christian faith, it means something a lot different. And, I mean, this is where being able to step outside of a faith tradition, which is easy to do because all you have to do is pick a different one that's not yours and, like, look over at it and say, well, I don't believe any of that crap. Um, most Christians are not operating inside the Islamic faith whatsoever, so they can read the Quran and they, you know, they can see it and vice versa. Uh, and in fact, you see massive criticisms of Islam from within Christianity. You see massive criticisms of uh, Christianity from within Islam. It's not at all ambiguous what's going on here. But the thing is, is with, with the social justice crowd or critical social justice crowd, um, they have what's called critical consciousness. The modern word for critical consciousness, that word actually stems back to the 70s, I think. It may even go earlier, but I know it goes back to the 70s. Um, the modern word for that is woke. And what it means is that you're operating from within the faith. You're woke to a critical consciousness. That's what woke is, is short for, really. Um but you, there, that's why you're seeing that parallelism, because it's it is the same thing. Uh, it's it functions as as a faith. Okay, this critical consciousness thing. But a couple of months back, a friend of mine was doing a performance art thing uh, near where I live, so I went to go see it. Not really my cup of tea, but like I said, yeah, it's a friend of mine, so I went to go see. It. At the end of it, there was a Q and A, and almost everyone there, I mean, you would describe as woke, right? Like, dude, there's just no other way to put it. They were all of that bent and all of that mindset. Every single question was spent dissecting. It was a 25 minute performance piece, and I mean, they like every single question. They were they were like it was okay. They would dissect five seconds second segment of it and say, well, why did you do this exactly here? And it was all about you know, whether she had some privilege. Art is supposed to, like, to me, art's supposed to convey some sort of emotion or feeling or make you feel something, make you sense something. Like, you know, it's it's, it's supposed to be a little bit more visceral. They want to take the joy out of everything. I mean, it's just awful. They're, they're Puritans. Um, and it's like the other thing I keep trying to tell people, and I don't know how to get them to understand it. I've tried a few different metaphors, and it's like I even ran into it last night with a friend of mine uh, who shared an article and then said, um, you know, I can't believe this is still happening. And there was something about <laughs> me, something about, I don't remember, something about how the coronavirus is sexist because it somehow impacts women more or something like this. Of <laughs> yeah, course, yeah. right? And so um, they were like, I just can't understand how they're still doing this. And it's like, I don't know how else to explain this. They don't know how to do anything else. When you have a critical consciousness, you see the world through a critical lens, so all you see are problematics and potential problematics. That's what it actually means to have a critical consciousness. You're doing what they call in discourse analysis a close reading. You're you're looking at, say, that performance, and you're looking at little tight, narrow parts of it closely. That's the close reading to try to discover where usually not even ex like obvious 
problematics are, but where hidden problematics are. So you're like trying to dig up secret privilege or secret racist intention or secret uh, not being cautious enough or correct enough with your language because it's believed that those things demonstrate the underlying bigotry that they believe must always be present because the bigotry is cooked into the system as a part of the system itself. So it's like my friend shared this and I was like, I can't believe they're still doing this. And I was like, why? They can't do anything else. They literally don't have the capacity to do anything else. It's like, again, to draw back to the religion, and I don't want to pick on anybody, but you know, as an atheist, this, this actually does get frustrating. It's like when you go hang out with one of your friends and maybe they're religious and it's like, you see this really beautiful, like, landscape and the sun shining through the clouds and you get those things that are called crepuscular rays coming down and they're like wow that's just like it's like god's touching the land it's like shut up <laughs> it's like you see god in everything right it's be- but the, the thing is is the god is in the lens you're looking at the world through and then over here in the critical stuff the lens is to see problems everywhere and they're not problems like real problems, like there's not enough gas in the tank to get to where we're going, but problems like little weird, I want to say moral problems, but it's actually like structural problems that that move the, the power dynamic along or perpetuate. I mean, they use, I, I'm so baked in their crap now, I use their own words all the time, maintain, perpetuate, inscribe, re-inscribe. <laughs> the systems of dominance and oppression to create marginalization. I mean, it's just, and they've trained themselves to see the world this way. And just like the Christian, for example, who can't do anything except see God in everything, right? Car crash, everybody, but one person dies. That person's injured. Wow. God was with that person and saved her. Mm -hmm. Like, are you kidding me? Um, the, just like the person who can't see anything except how God is is there, these people can't see anything except how power dynamics are screwing over the oppressed in everything they look at. And they call those things problematics. And being able to see that all the time is critical consciousness. So that's why you would experience something like that. You'd go to this and that's the people who are woke, who have a critical consciousness, are now in a mindset to where all they can see are – it's like – it's like when somebody says something a little bit like, I wonder if that's like, you might even see it and kind of giggle like, wow, that was a little risky to say, you know, to make this kind of like racial pun or whatever the deal might be. Well, a little risky, you know, they're like five alarm fire going off in their head. This is a catastrophe. This has to be purged. This has to be cleaned. There are actually reasons within their faith, which is called theory for why that is. But it sticks out to them like a sore thumb because it's like they have goggles on that make them see that stuff everywhere, always, even where it isn't. Okay, um, kind of sticking with this because we were, we were talking about this just a little before, and it was um, uh, so the okay. Why are you why are you focusing on the cultural war right now when you know there's a global pandemic now? Staying on what we were just talking about, I think there's two different sides of this culture war. There's, you know, whatever, the celebrity singing Imagine, which, <laughs> you know, you know, whatever, just laugh, let it go, who cares? Then there's, you know, like you mentioned the thing, oh, that's, well, this is a, uh, you know, it hit, it's hitting women harder than it's hitting men, even though men die off, you know, like at twice the rate, um, or are afflicted at twice the rate. Um, you know, it's... There was something in Washington State, uh, I don't know if it was in Seattle, but it's like, oh, where you put up the shelters and places for isolation, that was racist because of the neighborhoods you put them up in. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there was one outright, I, I don't want to say it where it was, but it was a big outlet, and it said something like, intersectionality is what we need to uh, to, 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 uh, to to solve this, this crisis. And so you don't want to say where it was because you don't remember, or you don't want to say because you want to protect them. Because I'm ready I, to buy. I have, I have no. I, I can't remember where it's from. I, I it's want to Queen say, Mary I, University in London. Is okay. where it's from. I'm ready to just. Bust oh, yeah, no, them no, for no that. that's fine. Like I, I, like I couldn't remember where it was from, um, but I think I've got. I might actually have your tweet here. Okay, now this is from uh, New York State, right? Because I, I see something like this in Canada. And more or less, once they started acting, they were okay up here. But 
there's still mm -hmm. some issues, but uh, where it says, okay, it's, you know, the city's data-driven health agenda. Now, uh, this is like Deputy Health Commissioner whatever, Barbo. Now, in Canada, every time they're giving a briefing, they always, almost always start it off, or at one point in the briefing, they'll say, you know, uh, science-based evidence. Mm-hmm. Yet we had our chief medical officer even just, I want to say two days ago, saying, uh, unless you're showing symptoms, you don't really, you know, a mask will do no good. Now, we can get into the debate about masks. Like, if you don't wear it properly, it's not going to do any good. You know, if you're just wearing some gauze, that's probably not going to do much. But, you know, like, you can talk about that. You can talk about the need to save masks for medical professionals because there's not enough and that you, you know, figure out how to address that issue. But to say science-based evidence, like, is this another thing of, like, them changing the words? Like, okay, evidence-based or, like, you know, like I said, up in Canada, science-based. Like, are they, are they just not – is it a shell game where they're not telling you what evidence they're using and what they consider science? Or, like, what is that? Yeah, there might be some of that going on. I mean, it's – there's a lot of like kind of funny narrative stuff happening around that. And of course people have been trying to invoke the power of science for whatever it is that they're saying for basically ever. I don't know the specifics of this. I do know that it seems to be growing very rapidly growing to be consensus that masks, even if they're something as silly as wearing a little gauze do have some impact. And then a good mask has a, you know, a tremendous impact. And then I saw a thing earlier today where somebody was tweaking with the numbers. It's like, even if it only changed the transmission rate, this tiny, tiny amount we're talking about to wear a mask. So maybe it's just like your shirt over your nose or something, mm -hmm. just a tiny amount of change. If that's all it did, it still saved something like 10 to 15% of the likely lives we're going to lose. So, I mean, the science behind the masks seems to be pretty settled in that wearing something is definitely better than wearing nothing. And the, obviously the properly fitted N95 mask or whatever respirator, I should say, is that what it's called is the correct thing to be wearing if you have them and there is a shortage. So medical professionals need them more than you do. And there are various issues around that. Um, what I can tell you though, is these pushes to make it like from Queen Mary, for example, to make it um, intersectional are not based in science whatsoever. They say that they're using an analysis and then you look at the analysis and it's just the same kind of argument and speculative nonsense that shows up in basically all of their so-called analyses. There's no data. There's no attempt to wrestle with data or to understand the underlying causes of why that data may be there. For instance, how much of how relevant is it that poverty is is the variable versus the fact that proportionally more ethnic minorities in certain areas are poor you know it's certain you know they're, they're not even trying to get to the bottom of what's really going on they're just saying oh well there could be greater racial impacts oh there could be greater uh gender impacts and you have to look at both of those at the same time where black women will be left out and then they look at it you know it's just it's very very not scientific it's very sparse um and the reason you do have to pay attention to that so I would say that we don't necessarily need to pay attention to a lot of the sillier culture war stuff. Uh, and we can probably or should probably be ignoring pundits a lot more. But we can't ignore what's going on with critical social justice specifically. And I wouldn't ignore what's going on with some of the far right stuff either because they're actually implementing their freaking agendas. Um, almost all the science that I've seen on this, and I don't want to appeal to science without it being good. So I'm going to say that I don't, I'm not an expert to evaluate this, but almost all the science I've seen on the matter says that, um, the pandemics actually cause people to go toward extreme values, extreme views, um, has something to do with the psychology of contagion. Um, Unlike, you know, getting together to fight a common enemy in like a war, the pandemic actually drives people toward extremism in their own particular directions for some set of reasons. This is sort of an extremist view. Uh, people try to also, in general, capitalize upon crises when they are extremists and activists. Never let a good crisis go to waste is the <laughs> old the old aphorism there. And so I was watching, for example— the other day, um, a, a name for people who pay attention to the critical social justice world, of course, is Kimberly Crenshaw. If you don't know who she is, she's a legal scholar that came from Harvard. 
she is one of the two people who is credited with having developed critical race theory together with her mentor at Harvard Law, Derek Bell. And she is the person who came up with the concept of intersectionality. So she's not a small figure in terms of all of this critical social justice stuff. She now has command of a couple of nonprofit organizations um, that are pretty solidly funded by other nonprofit grant giving organizations that we can't talk about who they are because everybody will think I'm a conspiracy theorist when I mentioned that they're the ones that are run by George Soros. But um, nevertheless, they're called the African American Policy Forum and the Center for Institute uh, for Intersectional Justice. And she's integral in both of these. And they've got this program going on right now where they're doing webinars like every couple of days with all these people. Um, again, if you want to suspect that the Soros thing was a weird thing to throw in there, his organization is called the Open Society Foundation. The first of the webinars they call Black Light or Shining a Black Light or something to show the cracks in a society, of course, uh, the hidden racism. Oh, sorry, the, just one sec. Was that the one you posted a couple of days ago? It is. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, the, I, I watched that. That's, a little, that's have, a little scary. Yeah, they have a representative from Open Society Foundation there who doesn't really say anything. So it's clear that he's just there like to represent, which means that the connection's not fake. And it, the Open Society Foundation gives gives the uh, African American Policy Forum a lot of money and to, to push, literally to push intersectionality in the Center for Institu uh, Intersectional Justice, which is centered somewhere in Europe, but still has Crenshaw as one of the directors, um, is also put, it's a Center for in, in, Intersectional Justice. What do you think it's pushing? And so anyway, they're talking about how the coronavirus is spreading and this brings up, you know, shining a black light. How the idea is that coronavirus is shining a black light on society because to show you all the hidden problems like you come into a crime scene and you sign you shine the black light and you can see you know various blood splatters or you know dried semen or whatever happens you know whatever gross stuff happens to be there the black light shows the hidden evidence right that's the metaphor that they're applying here of course i guarantee you they're doubling on the word black yeah. that, that they always do this but i mean the the recommendations in that 80 minute webinar which is like one of i know there are at least two but they i think they're doing an entire series and they seem to be coming out every couple of days so there may be three or four of them by now maybe there's just two i don't know i know there are two i've only watched the first one though i mean some of the recommendations are fairly reasonable about talking about trying to get um put together some kind of an organization to help p raise money for people who work in like caring professions who need extra support or cleaning, cleaning, I think professions because of them losing their jobs. Okay. This makes sense. And then of course they have to waffle about how it's disproportionately women of color, blah, blah, blah. And it's obviously got to be somehow, somehow, you know, societal power structures that force women of color to have cleaning jobs as opposed to something completely different. But nevertheless, some of these these proposals are fairly reasonable. And then some of them near the end, there's a woman who's at university of Pennsylvania law. And she says that one of the top priorities to deal with, to talk about voicing a political political agenda here, one of the top priorities to deal with in the, the COVID-19 pandemic is abolishing prisons, which is shocking. And her reasoning is because a, Prisons, if, if the infection gets in a prison, it's going to spread like wildfire throughout the prison. B, they probably are not going to have adequate medical care. And then C, of course, people in prison are disproportionately minority, especially black. Therefore, the equitable thing to do would be to abolish prisons and to use coronavirus as the reason to do so. And so, I mean, and then again, this isn't some fringe lunatic. This is a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania who is – who has been invited to speak for a lobbying, a, a very well-funded lobbying agency with uh, star power behind it, Kimberly Crenshaw's director, that is, it's a lobbying agency called the African American Policy Forum. And one of its primary agendas that's being promoted in response to the coronavirus is that it will lobby for is abolition of prison. And then you've got AOC tweeting that we have to just two days ago or something like that. You know, she's a congresswoman. Uh, say what, what, what you want about that. But here she is tweeting that 
the coronavirus response requires not just equity, but a lens toward reparations. That was our exact phrasing, lens toward reparations. And so you, the, the fact of the matter is that people who are activists, who think only in terms of politics, who are on the extreme fringe of that politics, are not going to let the crisis go to waste. And in fact, right before our eyes, they're using it. The Democratic Party, not to let anybody off the hook, but the Democratic Party intentionally put equity measures into the yeah. coronavirus relief bill that the, the United States Congress was trying to pass. I mean, Republicans put shit in there, too, that shouldn't be there. But nevertheless, the point remains that the critical social justice didn't go away because of the pandemic. It is making use of the pandemic. And think about it for like two seconds. Like, really, if you're listening to this, stop for like two seconds. Just think about this. These are people who look to exploit the problems in anything to push their political agenda. And a crisis situation is always going to be full of problems. They're just going to do more. They're going to actually speed up. And a lot of these people are well-funded on like university salaries or they're working for, like in the case of Crenshaw's group, they're working for like think tanks or universities or they're part of their own nonprofits. And they're just going to, they're not going to have real problems all of a sudden and stop their activism. They have all damn day to do their activism. And we have a government I shouldn't say a government. We have governments all over the world who are trying to implement emergency measures that have vast expansions of their power, hopefully are temporary, that people are happy to consent to because we need an emergency response in an emergency. And then you have these people who are literally doing nothing but lobbying for their preferred agendas. And I guarantee you they're not trying to make those things temporary. They're trying to make policies like equity and health equity and, and environmental equity become permanent features of the law. Okay. That's the, like that, that's scary enough. And I've, I've got some real concerns in Canada about some of this because of a couple of new ministries, but the reparations thing, cause I started seeing this on some right wing stuff and okay. You know, lay blame at the, you know, the CCP lay blame at how they, you know, handle this the Chinese government Chinese administration is just horrible all that but I see a lot on the right wing side like we need re like using the terms reparations from China for this you know for the damage that this caused funny how that spreads isn't it yeah and like when you mention the extremism thing that's one thing that worries me about this like this particular situation okay like you said if it's a war or whatever you go out you fight the enemy uh you know, if it's a natural disaster, you go up, you can help build, you know, if it's a hurricane or a flood, you can go help build, you know, like sandbag barriers. You can, there's stuff you can do. There's something you can fight. Like this, it's, okay, run away home and hide, and that's how you're fighting, right? That's like, flight is actually fight, and it's it's really screwed up. Um, but you're going to have a lot of people sitting at home going online, and they're going to, you know, they don't have the chance to go to work and hang out with everyone else. And maybe get a different viewpoint, or even if they're in school, they might at least get offended by a different viewpoint somewhere, right? Yep. People... Stress and uh, stress and fear, the kind of conditions yeah. they create vulnerability, yeah. and that I think we even talked about it last time I was on the mm -hmm. show. I think that, that that's how you radicalize somebody yeah. is by exploiting that vulnerability. Oh, and okay, just while we're on this, that though you'd mentioned Peter was going into the pedagogy. The shit I see coming out of schools, I'm like, you're okay, you're going to educate a generation that's going to be right to be radicalized because you're going to teach them to be pissed off, disenfranchised, feel like they're marginalized, either feel ashamed of themselves or, you know, pissed off at other people for oppressing them. Whatever. Like, that's what, like, that's one of the most horrific things, like what they're doing in grade schools and like high schools oh, yeah. and this stuff. That's uh, super widespread, too. That is yeah. one of the major problems. That's one of the easiest places that they were able to institutionalize. Okay. Um, to kind of bounce back a second, since yeah. you mentioned natural disasters, mm -hmm. that's the example I wish I would have thought of um, when I said that they tend to bring people together because mm -hmm. there's 
I mean, there's not a political element to a natural disaster itself. In fact, you could think of the pandemic as a natural disaster in a, in a sense, but it's much different because it's not like a, a consolidated event. It just goes and goes and goes. But these are people, and obviously there are political elements to the responses to a, like Hurricane Katrina to a natural disaster. But these are people who obviously politicize the living crap out of that. And they don't do so again in that kind of reasonable way they do so in a way that suits their agenda. So even in that webinar, the blacklight webinar I was just talking about, they bring up the example of Hurricane Katrina and they talk about how, well, Katrina, you know, damaged uh, minority neighborhoods, black neighborhoods in particular, much worse than it did white neighborhoods. And of course, this is a this is a function of poverty more than it is anything else, but they're just happy to conflate the idea that poverty and racism are the same thing because they actually do believe that if there's dis different outcomes, so in this case, poverty uh, versus affluence, then it must be the result of some form of bigotry. It can't be any other possible variable like the fact that poverty is hard to climb out of, et cetera. It has to be a manifestation of a system of racism. But at least in the video, I thought it was pretty, pretty funny because one of the things that they do is, is, is they make these arguments and they don't even have to like, it's like they just say this stuff and it doesn't even have to make sense. So I don't know if you caught it. So you said you watched it yeah. when they're talking about Katrina and they're talking about the black neighborhoods being disproportionately destroyed. They're actually showing a picture of a destroyed house. There's a yeah. woman and a dog and it's like a black and white, you know, checkerboard yeah. fl kitchen floor. I don't know if you remember this. And it's a white woman standing there while they're talking about how black neighborhoods were destroyed disproportionately by the by the, the hurricane. It's like it's like they don't even have to make sense to make well, their argument. Yeah, well, that was the evidence of the gentrification, right? Right, of course, the destroyed white woman's house. That yeah. So it's like they don't even have. That's why this stuff's so dangerous. Is they are able to implement their stuff. I can tell you right now, I am literally a professional at this. Do you know how easy it is to just make up arguments that don't make sense? It's really easy. <laughs> it's really easy to make up arguments that don't have to make sense. If you are freed from the burden of having to make sense, of having to have good evidence, of having to ha be able to really tightly make your case, if you are free from that burden, it is so easy to make arguments. And then if you can persuade people with those by going and saying, oh, well, it's racism if you don't understand this. It's racism if you don't agree. It's racism if you don't implement this. It's racism if you don't teach this to kids the way we taught or the way we're, we're advising you to. It's racism if you don't hire our consulting group to remake your school as a critical theory, um, not indoctrination. It's like reprogramming because it's changing how people think it's it's not changing what they think it's how they think that they're changing so it's it's not indoctrination it's reprogramming so we're gonna you're gonna it's racist if you don't hire us for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to come in and consult and turn your school into a reprogramming center i mean if you can do that and they do and it works um the the, the world's your oyster at least until you break it um it's, it's a scary time Okay, the, the, the money thing and all that. Like, right now. Oh, Jesus. Okay. But, That's but, the but, other thing. Yeah, but, you, but, hold on. You think that this shit, people think this is just going to go away when there's literally billions of dollars being dumped into it by donors, by its own industry. I mean, we're talking like tens of billions of dollars go into this crap every year right now outside of administrator salaries at universities. I'm not talking about those people. Tens of billions of dollars go into this industry a year. A lot of it is is big, you know, millionaire and billionaire donor money. You think they're just gonna like drop their investment because because there's a virus? It's like it's just not realistic thinking. No, but like I'm I'm concerned about like, all right. Uh, I just read an article today, or maybe it was late last night, about hospitals asking doctors and nurses to take pay cuts because there's not. You know, they're running low on funds. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, do you really need all those administrators? Do you, do, you, do you really need, you know, diversity and equity officers right now? Like, do you I really can't speak to that within hospitals, but man, I can speak to it within universities yeah. because what I understand, what I keep seeing now out of like the academic side of the world is that, uh, massive, massive budget cuts are going to hit universities. And maybe it's overdue. 
who knows? Um, but massive budget cuts are going to hit universities, so they're they're really constricting on hiring, blah blah blah. As a result of this, but the administrative bloat in universities is staggering, and whether or not those people are going to be very likely to give up their jobs <laughs> is unclear. Usually, what you see is let's get rid of um, full time faculty members or hire fewer full time faculty members and let them retire out if they're tenured. Mm-hmm. And replace them with adjuncts who, as it works out per hour, have usually PhDs and get paid less than minimum wage to do a job that is more or less literally thankless. Um, So what you're going to see is kind of a reckoning in the universities. Will they get rid of these diversity administrators who bring nothing to the university. They just create costs for the massive costs, not just their salaries. They drag everything down. They make everything more bureaucratic and and make everything less functional. Are we going to get rid of them or are they going to replace new faculty hires with let's hire a bunch of adjuncts? So we basically don't have to pay. And I think you can guess what's likely to happen. So, yeah. well, you know, the university might be about to screw itself big time. To hear that that might be happening in hospitals also is a bit alarming. Of course, speaking of the blacklight metaphor, if you want to actually use it properly, I think that the United States healthcare system is about to have a little bit of a light shined on it, tying health insurance to employment and then the – you know, the fracturing of the Affordable Care Act, which was supposed to make it so if people are suddenly unemployed, they still have health insurance. That was part of the program there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, okay, the healthcare thing, that's that's an issue. Like, I mean, the, the, like I, I come from a place that has socialized healthcare, so, you know, you know, I have complaints, but overall, I'm pretty happy. Like, I had a kidney removed a, four, a few years ago it cost me 35 bucks a day to stay in a hospital for about, for about three days. So, you know, I, I can't complain about that, man. <laughs> like, Oh my God, that's <laughs> like a freaking dream, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, like, like with the, with the schools, um, cause I mean, like I said, I saw this from the hospitals. I'm just like, okay, well you don't need administrators. You need doctors. It should be easy what to cut. But the school thing, uh, if I'm, if I own a VR company right now, I'm figuring out a virtual classroom to roll out by September. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the amount of people that the academy's kicked out, and you can find all kinds of lists, you know, okay, well, these were left-wing people who got kicked out big from right-wing schools and blah, blah, blah. You know, like, the academy on both sides, and it's mainly left-wing because that's what the academy is, has kicked out a, a lot of good people. Yep. Or has kept a lot of good people away. Yep. If you can figure out a virtual school that doesn't have all this shit, you know, I think you could. Yep. And it's cheaper for me, you know, like what, uh, my enrollment includes a set of VR goggles. Well, great. You know, um, but at the same time, like, well, one of the things you're talking about, they're always finding problems like, oh, well, you can't put out your videos because they're not subtitled. Like, right. Okay, right. Like, okay. So no. It's not no child left behind. It's all children left behind now. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so there are a couple of things there. I think you are right that the university system and maybe even the public education, but more the university system is going to is about to land itself a massive market competitor that it was not expecting to have to contend with that may have a lot less bureaucratic uh, bureaucratic weight behind it and a lot less of this BS. And it's mostly going to be staffed with people who they thought weren't progressive enough to maintain the cathedral. So um, that's going to be interesting, uh, an interesting offshoot of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, as for um, these things about equity, right? So the subtitles on videos, for example, specifically, I understand a couple of things with that. One is I understand that it would be unfair genuinely unfair to roll out videos without subtitles when you have deaf students, but to make no other accommodation for those deaf students. So giving them the ability to finish the course over the summer after subtitling can be done, some kind of a delay, something like that would have to be, you know, offered alongside. But to hold up the whole system is an issue. Secondly, I understand that this is actually, according to 
laws, like actual statutes that have been written, that were not written to contain flexibility uh, provisions should something come up. I mean, so Americans with Disabilities Act, for example, doesn't provide leeway for them to get around. So some of these schools are acting in, you know, from their diversity office, but a lot of them are acting genuinely with response to laws that weren't made to be flexible uh, should something all of a sudden come up. So there are multiple dimensions to the problem. I don't want to be unfair or just like slap things down. But the the thing is, is that in, a, in an emergency, you do have to be able to take contingencies. And uh, you do want to make sure that the laws that are written are going to make room for that. And so if we want to kind of tie this back to the sort of problems that new discourses exist to solve, and in particular critical social justice, is that it's not well known for its flexibility. <laughs> in fact, it is the opposite. You know, they, they have absolutely no flexibility even in the words that you're allowed to use to describe a thing. Um, like your career is over for the rest of your life if you use the wrong word. And I'm not even talking about the N word. There are lots of sensitive words you can't use. Um, you can get banned from Twitter forever for saying that men aren't women, um, for example, which is generally speaking, not a controversial statement. Yep. Well, okay. Uh, the speaking of words and the, cause this kind of sticks with all of this and it, it's just going back to the Academy a little bit, but well, I think it was in January, the WHO put out that thing. Oh, don't talk about people, uh, infecting others and blah, blah, blah. Oh, blah, yeah. blah. And like it, everything the Academy's done, and, and okay, and I, I don't want to use a broad brush because it's, you know, it's, it's large chunks of administration as far as I can tell, and it's certain faculty, right? It's not the Academy in general. But, Correct. Uh, it's an attack from the inside on expertise. I agree, yes. And, and right now, like, the WHO has done themselves a huge disservice by, you know, kowtowing to the Chinese... Uh, media outlets have done themselves a, like a huge disservice for a while now, but especially since 2016 when Trump got elected in, um, or you know his campaign or whatever, however far, far back you want to go, where no one trusts anyone at all anymore. Right. And at this moment, when we need expertise, like <sighs> welcome to postmodernity, folks. Yep. All and you people out there, by the way, who've <sighs> ever defended postmodernism, like maybe it's okay. <laughs> this is what it looks like. This is the real deal. This is where the drill is over. This is post-modernity. You can't trust anybody. You don't know what's true. Everything's a political argument, and so you have to spend hours breaking down people's biases to try to figure out what they're saying and why. You can't. No source is authoritative. It's all narrative. Welcome to postmodernism. This is what it looks like. And if you don't like it, it's probably time to stand up against postmodernism, whether it's showing up on the right or the left, or mostly the left, of course. Um, this is what it looks like. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's craziness. Um, look, I just got a couple of things I wanted to ask you because, like I said, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know you are working on a few things. Um, but on the right, like, I don't know if I don't think it was you that wrote it, but uh, I read it because I thought I think I saw you tweeted out. It was an article about postmodernism on the right, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, I have it, not written that yet. I do talk about it a little bit on uh, Twitter and uh, elsewhere sometimes, but uh, the guy who wrote about it most notably is Matt McManus. And I know he's written a lot for Aereo, and he's written beyond that, and I think he has a book about it. Because, I mean, like I said, I, I see some of it with, again, I'll, I'll ping it up like Candace Owens and someone like Charlie Kirk, right? These people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you guys came up with the term uh, grievance studies, I just started calling, like, everyone collectively left or right. I just, like, they're, they're like Jehovah's Witnesses. They're grievance witnesses. Mm -hmm. witnessing grievances <laughs> everywhere right like and that's an awesome way to put it and that's that's exactly what they are like i mean charlie kirk and i love that and, and candace owens i mean i, I guess you get an argument can be made that charlie kirk's not really red pilled because he was always republican but whatever i mean that mentality is no different than the woke garbage and it's the same basis like i mean do you have like do you know a bit about the background of that or is it based in the same literature or where's that coming from 
So, I, I mean, I don't know the literature around the postmodern right very well. I do have my own thoughts about it. I would say that in very general general terms, what I just said about postmodernism is the case. It's where everything's narrative and nobody knows what's true. Another hallmark of postmodernism is the hot take. And so whoever's just making hot takes is probably a, pushing a postmodernist uh, approach. They may not be a postmodernist themselves in the narrow sense or the formal sense, but the hot take is a critical take. And I don't mean that critical in the sense of, um, you know, critical thinking. I mean that in the sense of critical theory. So the hot take is the object. It is the problematizing thing. It is the thing that deconstructs by revealing the internal contradictions or the absurdities or that takes an existing power dynamic and flips it on its head while maintaining the buyer, uh, the binary at its heart. These are the elements of postmodernism and they can be used by right or left to criticize their opponents, to criticize whatever they want to criticize. So you certainly see it. What I see with postmodern conservatism, and I'm not, I haven't really sat down and worked out my thoughts on this in depth yet, is that the, the, with deconstruction, that's Derrida. So Derrida is relevant kind of across the board in terms of that tool. But where you have the left postmodernists are much more Foucault. And even depending on which branch of them, Derrida into it, the the broader sense of his philosophy, um, they're much more Michel Foucault oriented. They're talking about systems of power, systems of knowledge, and systems of power being the same thing, and so on. On the right, you have more of kind of Lyotard and Baudrillard being the kind of the postmodernism that they are showing, and the Lyotard is the rejection of meta narratives or unifying narratives uh, in favor of local or mini narratives that, that so when you try to say well we're going to say this from the conservative angle that's a mini narrative you have now stepped into a mini narrative you have left the meta narrative of say the truth or accessing objectivity and now you are entering a mini narrative and that that was what leotard's whole point was to be skeptical of meta narratives and return toward many narratives. And then the the other thing Leotard did was like just completely foobar science. And there are ways in which um, the right obviously does that. There are also ways in which the left does that. Uh, Baudrillard was more about like images. Um, the easiest summary, although I guess I read somewhere that Baudrillard rejected it, so I don't know if that's true, but the easiest summary for people, if you want to know what Baudrillard's philosophy kind of was, is The Matrix. Um, it's that the world is actually because of how it's become able to produce and reproduce, make replicas of mass produce, uh, the, the kind of, when, anytime you see one of those things where it shows like the panning shot that shows the, the, something on like TV and then it shows the studio and you see how fake it is, mm -hmm. that's kind of a, a, like a Baudrillard sort of style reveal. And that's a very postmodern thing to do. So that would have been kind of the mentality that, that that Baudrillard was was coming at it from, and you kind of see a lot of that with the postmodern conservative thing. Um, they're very, you know, everything. The, the the left is just constructing a narrative. The media, the liberal media thing, and if you see behind the curtain, they're really terrible. Blah blah blah. The Democrats just want you to believe this, but if you see behind the curtain, you can see. So there's a very Baudrillard and Leotardian kind of. Uh, postmodernism that's more prominent on the left, or sorry, on the right, whereas the left is going to be more interested in where like Foucault was was power dynamics and knowledge constructing power dynamics. So you, the idea of cultural knowledge, which is then going to get tied into like cultural relativism. The, so the the white nationalists responding to the to the attacks on whiteness and from the left are actually dipping into they're, they're taking up the Foucault spear and nobody wants that to develop very far the other side is when you see people say oh binaries we have to deconstruct binaries well th those people are mostly on the left and they're dipping into to, uh, derrida there so you see more foucault derrida on the left and more baudrillard leotard on the right although it all kind of mixes and mashes together and they're not the only ones of course you know there are um there are other postmodernists that i'm not getting into deleuze guattari lacan they go on, Rorty, they go on and on. Yeah, 
Okay, I, I Rorty I, would be more on the left, also, by the way, because he his view was and this is what's kind of relevant to the narratives thing in in a sense, uh, is that um, the it, the the world is out there, but the truth isn't out there. So that's something that Rorty wrote in a lot of his philosophy was ba- his postmodern philosophy was based off of that, which means that the that reality really exists. We just we can't actually know about it. What we think we know is just a bunch of constructs that are ultimately cultural. Um, and so there, we, we have this impenetrable veil keeping us from objectivity. So rather than say we can approximate it or hold it up as an ideal, which is what science did to deal with it, philosophies of science did to deal with that issue. He said, it's basically just throw it out completely The you know, the truth is a, contingent thing and so uh you see a a little bit more of that mentality you know right now with all this narrative warring so anywhere though you see narrative war or you need to have the the um alternative facts post-truth our truth my truth anywhere you see any of that coming up the conservative angle the ingram angle as a matter of fact uh you're looking at postmodern conservatism or postmodernism more general yeah, the, the narrative thing. Like, I, I said this, I was speaking of a friend of mine, and I said this a little while back, and I said it was, and I think right around 2000, 2001, and then 9-11 was kind of like, um, like a, whatever, a, a nexus for all of this, right? So, like, around 2000, 2001, I, the way I look at this, and, like, oh, this is obviously, like, a very distance glance at this, that's when the first people with, like, graduate and doctoral level degrees in gender studies and all that, like the, the studies, right, came, were coming out and going into work more or less, like into like middle manager and stuff. And then the internet was starting to go bigger and around that time, 2000, 2001, and it just started really taking off. And then with 2011, or, two, or with 9-11 in 2001, it like was the rise of the narrative. So mm-hmm. like those three things met together and then, you know, you had one thing going on because of Bush for eight years and then you had another thing going on for Obama for eight years and then, you know, like one counter to each other. And then now it's like, I don't like the term fake news. I think it's kind of useless. It's like, it's narrative driven news. Like that's why no one could trust everything. Like everything's driven by this narrative. And I, I think that was a really bad unintended consequence of 9-11 was like this rise of the narrative since that happened well i mean again it's like never let a crisis go to waste becomes relevant because 9-11 became a touch point wherein that was able to be really easily pushed Mm -hmm. um i would actually point that you know right-wing talkback radio and left-wing bullshit in the university and the political correctness wars all reach back much earlier uh, into the into the 80s. And so it was like you had this thing brewing and steaming and cooking up both on, on left and right, uh, this sort of postmodern narrative-driven mindset. And then all of a sudden 9-11 comes and boom. I, no, I, 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 okay, I, I won't argue with that because I was in university and like I was in college and universities in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, like – I remember at one point there was a blood drive at my university and this was right around the time where the Canadian blood services added some more questions in there because of HIV. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there was a big meeting about it that broke up the bar and, uh, I was just there to have a drink. And then this thing, big meeting where it breaks out and people were like, they were comparing it to eugenics because they were asking some questions about if you're an intravenous drug user, you know, if you've had homosexual sex, if you paid for sex and it was just like, so, I mean like this stuff was there, but I was talking about the specific people who graduated with, well, I've got a PhD in, you know, critical oh, yeah, race. Yeah, yeah, thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so like th- those well, people started coming out, I think around 2000. That's 2000 the thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's like cultural touch points that really cause them to blow up. And before mm-hmm. that feminism, like the science wars was mostly not this stuff. It was mostly this science wars took place through the nineties and late eighties. Mm-hmm. And that was, some of those were postmodernists for sure. There was postmodernism versus science, but it was primarily feminism that was doing it. So you had kind of some of the postmodern stuff. You had some of the, uh, the, um, feminist empiricism is what, what was really being pushed. You actually needed a feminist science 
And so this was, you know, it had a very particular character. And then that kind of got discredited. But all those people were, I mean, that was a massive industry building up. So all of these PhDs that you're talking about, you had this cultural touch point with 9-11 that causes them to be able to come forth, right? Another major cultural touch point in this regard is the Black Lives Matter movement, or more accurately, the shooting of first Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman and then of Michael Brown by the police officer in Ferguson. And those incidents launched the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, into the massive public consciousness, whether there was injustice involved in Trayvon Martin, I tend to think there probably was a great deal of it, whether there was injustice in the Michael Brown and Ferguson situation, I tend to think there probably wasn't very much there. Uh, that's irrelevant. In 2015, Black Lives Matter absolutely blew up. That's also the year Tana Hesse Coates published um, Between the World and Me. And so you have like this, all of a sudden, critical race theory has this opportunity and intersectionality have this opportunity to boom, blow onto the mainstream. And if you go look, I mean, you can see people do these graphs where they go back and look up all of these words that we hear all the time, structural racism and all these different new kind of like left buzz terms we've all had to learn in five years that I'm making an encyclopedia about. Um, they all just kind of magically come onto the scene in 2014, 15. I mean, the, the explosion around 2015 is undeniable and everything sort of changed around 2015. And my contention actually is that, that the Trump presidency has been another one of these things that has just massively accelerated the drive of narrativism and uh, this warring narratives phase that we're kind of in now um, into the mainstream. Yeah. Well, um, like I was saying, I don't want to take up too, too much of your time. Um, we've going out for a little bit. I, I don't know if you got anything else you want to talk about or if you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you, where they can buy your... Like I know your book with Peter and then your upcoming book where they can take a look sure. at that. And then so, new discourses as well, sorry. Yeah, kind of do a little new discourses wrap up, but I'll mention the two books first. Um, at last September I had a book. It's actually, this is turning out, a lot of people are contacting me right now and telling me it's great for the pandemic. Uh, Peter Bogosian and I published a book called How to Have Impossible Conversations. Uh, it came out, like I said, last September. There are lessons in there, particularly how to approach the issue of assigning blame, uh, the issue of when to let your friends be wrong and just not have the argument. And there's a, there's a lot of really relevant stuff around how to have a conversation, how to understand, get people to understand issues differently or help them understand them differently or help yourself understand what people mean. There's a lot of practical advice in there that people are finding very useful for talking about the pandemic or being trapped with their families in quarantine during the pandemic um, and and just dealing with the situation all over. So it might be good to pick up. Uh, I've got at some point in the future, like we talked about at the beginning, I've got cynical theories coming out with Helen Pluckrose. The goal of cynical theories is actually to explain the postmodern part of what you're seeing in critical social justice. There's also a neo-Marxist part Um critical theory part to it but the postmodern part has been very vi vigorously resisted um by a lot of scholars so helen and i wrote a book to explain how it is in fact postmodern how it thinks where it came from where the the lines of literature trace back to these philosophers in the 60s and 70s uh going into the 80s and hopefully that will be out it's available for pre-order now hopefully that'll be out this summer I, tentatively it's august now although june was a possibility i have no idea where it'll land now with the pandemic so pre-order it uh it will be very elucidating if you're interested in this topic and in the meantime you can go to new discourses which is my project now i mostly am creating there a repository of educational materials that help people understand how critical social justice thinks but I would definitely be open if anybody's listening and wants to try to write something to exploring postmodern conservatism, postmodernism in general, critical theory in general, whether it's showing up in application on the left or the right. If people want to analyze the Trump phenomenon in those terms, I'm happy to look at that. I actually think that's a crucial part of what's happening right now. But um, – my focus in particular is to explain critical social justice and how it thinks because that's where my expertise happens to lie. And the biggest part of what I'm doing there is building this encyclopedia that I call Translations from the Wokish uh, that explains 
three different kinds of terms, um, everyday terms in our language like racist or diversity or inclusion that the critical social justice mindset uses in a different way, specialized terms like privilege preserving epistemic pushback, epistemic oppression, um, these kind of very academic jargony phrases uh, to explain what they mean in case you happen to come across them or want to understand how they fit into the picture. And then background terminology like neo-Marxist, postmodern, um, you know, the, the kind of philosophical roots, uh, critical theory that say where this stuff came from. And again, the, the kind of net effect of all this should help anybody who wants to spend a little bit of time with it understand how – the critical social justice movement thinks, how it uses language, how it communicates, and how it is able to push itself in, in, into institutions so that if you want to just understand it, you can. If you want to be able to push back or organize resistance, you can. Um, if you want to be able to just have handy links when somebody on social media gets pissed off and is like, you're just showing your whiteness, blah, 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 boom, you can post the link to the whiteness entry. On the encyclopedia, I do this every day, and I feel glorious every time I do it. It's like somebody's like, yeah, 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 you know, epistemic injustice, da, 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 and it's just like, plop, there's the link. That's what it means. And then it's really interesting if I do that to people who believe in it. They're like, what is this crap? And they get all upset. Um, and if I do it to people who are trying to understand, they're like, wow, thank you. I didn't understand that. It's like really – I hope good. Let me actually mention with those entries, by the way, I think this is extremely important to convey. My goal isn't to bash critical social justice. My belief, in fact, is that critical social justice bashes itself. You just have to understand it and then you'll run away from it in horror, um, except for a very small percentage of the population. And so my goal is to present it fairly and accurately, but not as though I support it. So it's kind of detached that I won't lie. There's a little, I mean, there are some Easter eggs in there of me kind of throwing shade on it here and there. Some pretty nasty ones. In fact, I think they're hilarious if you go find them. But um, for the most part, my goal is to accurately portray the way that these words are being used, the way that the people who use them think. And so on every entry, not only do I attempt to steal men or at least accurately portray their view um, while explaining it, from an outsider's perspective, I also provide at least one and often several examples of that concept being put to use within their usually scholarly, but sometimes activist literature. So you can see, like, I'm not making it up. I'm not exaggerating it. They really do say this. It's hard to read their stuff, I admit. I, um, hopefully my my translation from the Wokish helps make it a little easier it's, but you can actually see I'm trying to represent their idea faithfully. Just you never get to hear it from people who understand it unless they also support it. So I'm trying to show it from the perspective of somebody who understands it who doesn't support it. Yeah. And like I, I got to say again, just because I read and obviously, you know, like I haven't read as much as you have. You know, I think I've read five books and a bunch of papers and then. One of the books I had, they said there was like the 25 papers that was the formation of critical race theory and include Bell's paper and Crenshaw's paper. And, uh -huh. and you read those and then you read your, like the way you define this stuff. Like I, like I highly recommend if you've ever been wondering about racism as power plus prejudice and you know, all kinds of other associated nonsense, go check out that. Cause it, it, it spells it out fairly easily and it's got links to everything. It, it, Cause it's the stuff is scary anyways uh thanks a lot for coming back on james uh it's a lot of fun and uh yeah thanks everyone for listening